Hey guys, in this lesson we're going to take a look at a introduction to freezing. This forms part of the heat transfer course and is covered in most universities looking at the transfer of heat through food systems. Now if we take a quick introduction then the freezing time is the most critical factor when it's associated with the selection of freezing systems in order to ensure the optimum product quality. Because when we talk about freezing in the food industry, one of the most important parameters to determine is the quality of the food when it is unfrozen. So this ensures that the end user or the consumer is getting the highest purity and quality of food. Now freezing time requirements establish system capacity, while the same parameter can have a direct influence on the product quality again. So as you can see, that the product quality is consistently referred to in this um, type of system. Now to ensure the efficient selection of the freezing system there are several different methods for the prediction of freezing time and they are a very important parameter to find to, in order to determine what is the, the required time of freezing that this food has to be exposed to in order to achieve a desired product quality value. Now there's three distinct periods that we'll see on the graph which is associated within a food which undergoes freezing. So we have the pre-freezing stage, we have the phase change and then we have the post-freezing. Each has their own separate characteristics, they have their own distinct location within the, the freezing graph. Now a key calculation in the design here uh, of freezing processes is the determination of the freezing time. So that's one of the most important things for us as chemical engineers when we design these systems is to find the freezing time. Now if we consider a simple experiment that would illustrate the three periods. So what we'll do is we measure the temperature change in the freezing of pure water. So this is important that we have to have pure water. Now ideally what we would use is deionized water. That way we have no impurities uh, within the system. Now we measure the temperature change in order to turn the pure water into ice by placing in an ice cube tray. Now what we can then do is say for example just in your home freezer with a thermocouple located inside. The second part of the experiment is then to measure the temperature in a small stick of potatoes, so usually in the form of, say, french fries. And we place this in a freezer in the same conditions and we measure the temperature for which the, the stick of potato turns into a solid um, phase. Now what this would look like on a graph for a temperature time plot is something like this. So we have our temperature here. Now this can be in seconds or it can be in heat removal. Either or is acceptable. Now this straight line here, so these, this curve here, what we have, this is for the pure water system. And we have our distinct three sections of the graph. So I'm going to break this up into the three sections. This part here is the pre-freezing. Because what we do is we start from the temperature, say it's at room temperature, and we move to just below zero degrees Celsius. And so what we remove here is sensible heat. So this is a change in the temperature of the system because we go from, say this is five degrees, to just below zero degrees, so say minus one. Now this small section here is known as the supercooling region. Because what tends to happen is when we move into the phase change, this gives off a slight subtle amount of heat. So this brings us back to zero degrees Celsius. And the phase change, so that is this section here, is we don't remove any temperature in the terms of sensible heat, but what we remove is the latent heat within the system. So remember the removal of latent heat is the phase change. So from this point here to that point there, we then move from a liquid state to a solid state. But we don't remove any difference in temperature value. This then comes in the post-freezing, so this would be the post-freezing section, whereby we remove the remaining amount of sensible heat.
So at this point, we are now solid material and we then remove the excess heat in order to reach an equilibrium within the freezer. Now, the reason that these are pure straight lines is because this is pure water. For the potato, we have the, the characteristics, but we don't have it in such a prominent way. We have our pre-freezing section. We have a tiny, tiny supercooling region. We have the flat section here, which is our phase change, but then it begins to dip. And probably from about this point, we then have the post-freezing because the temperature is now starting to change. So as soon as the temperature starts to change, in fact, you could probably even go as far as here. Once the temperature starts to change, we then enter the post-freezing section. And that's how you would go about reading this type of chart. It's a very, very easy chart and a very, very important chart in order to be able to define and determine the different phases. So again, this is just the explanation as to what we said uh, previously. So during the pre-cooling period, the temperature of the water decreases. We get to the supercooling region below zero. When the crystals start to form and nucleation, we get an increase to zero degrees. The temperature remains constant in the phase change where we reduce the latent heat of fusion. When all the liquid is changed into solid ice, we then enter the post-freezing period. Now, again, for the potato, the temperature plot obtained during the freezing is similar as we've seen. However, there is some subtle differences. Because, like the water temperature decreases during the pre-cooling, the sensible heat is removed. However, the temperature at which the initial nucleation occurs and the ice crystals begin to form is much lower than that of the water. So we've seen that the graph, if we go back, was much further than here. And this is to account for the, the potato itself. So this is essentially the solutes present in the food. Now after the brief period of the supercooling, the latent heat is gradually removed. And again, we've seen this, and then it slowly and subtly then goes into the post-freezing section where the remaining water becomes more concentrated within the solute, and this depresses the freezing point. Now, this gradual change in the temperature with the additional removal of latent heat continues until the food is largely a mix of the initial solid food components and ice rather than pure water. And then after this time, the remaining sensible heat is removed and then we reach the end point temperature. So again, this is just the summary of the chart that we've seen. Now, typically, the fruits and vegetables are frozen to a temperature of roughly minus 18 degrees Celsius, whereas foods with higher fat content, such as ice cream, fatty fish, they tend to freeze around minus 25 degrees. Now, from this, we can have several different conclusions from these simple freezing experiments. In that, the freezing involves the removal of both sensible and latent heat. We agree with that. We've seen that in the graph. The freezing of pure water exhibits sharp transitions between the, the different freezing periods, whereas the food transitions are more gradual. We've seen that in the chart. The endpoint temperature for the freezing foods for the frozen food may still have some water present. Now, this is key in that the rule of thumb is that it's 10%. So we try and assume that when we reach our uh, freezing point, then we should ensure that the food still has 10% liquid water. And this can be at a rough minus 18 degrees Celsius. So we don't want 100% ice. We want 90% ice, 10% liquid water. Now, the freezing time, as we said, is the most critical factor associated with the selection of the freezing systems in order to ensure, again, here it is, the product quality, the optimum product quality. And the freezing time requirements help us to establish the system's capacity. And we have two different methods for the prediction. We have Planck's equation, which is a relatively simple uh, system. However, it does have some notable limitations. Whereas FAM's method relies more completely on the physical aspects of the process and provides a more accurate set of results.
Now the FAMS method can be used in spreadsheets because there can be a lot of iterative calculations. So for a more accurate system we use FAMS method, but for a generalized system to be easily determined, roughly we can use Planck's equation. Now both of these equations we go into the details on the different equations associated with the Planck's and the FAMS method. We carry out several different exercises in our online course. I'll put a link in the description to our heat transfer course for you to check out. But that is the two methods that in terms of our chemical engineering modules that we cover when we talk about the freezing time. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this lesson was helpful in giving you a fundamental understanding of the freezing time and the freezing curve and how we can interpret and carry out experimentation. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible. Thank you for your time and we hope to see you in another video.